Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be discussing critical race theory, the controversy surrounding it, and the importance of providing a clear-eyed view of this country and its history. Our guests today are Dr. J. Allen Bryant, who teaches at Appalachian State University and is also director of the Gaduji program there, a partnership between the university and the Cherokee Central Schools. Dr. Trinidad Gonzalez, a history of Mexican-American studies teacher at South Texas College and a co-founding member of the Refuse to Forget organization. And Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, an associate professor of history at Ohio State University, where he teaches courses on the civil rights and black power movements. It is so wonderful to have you here. You know, I have been so exercised about the debate that is going on uh, on the teaching of history and what constitutes a valid perspective in the United States on history. I, I, do, I would just like to sort of go around the room and if you could each comment on not necessarily critical race theory per se, but on what is the purpose of teaching history and American history uh, in this country. And, and let's let's go around. I've got I've got this organized where, where um, counterclockwise, Alan, then Trinidad, and then uh, Hassan. So, Alan, could you give us a short um, take on what history, teaching history, should be about? I think we have to remind ourselves that, you know, when we talk about history and when we teach history, we're teaching the history of us. We're teaching about who we are. We're teaching about what we believe in, what our value systems are and how we develop those. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite quotes that I tell my future history teacher students is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he said, there is, there is no history, there is only biography. And, and I love that quote because it remind, I hope it reminds my students that when we talk about this subject, we're talking about the history of us. We're talking about our stories and the stories of our ancestors and their struggles and their triumphs. And in some cases, their defeats. Um, but it, it's, it's the foundation, I think, for everything we do, both intellectually, but also in our engagement uh, with the society around us. And, and I really think it's the starting point um, for everything we, we hope to be as active and engaged and informed citizens in, in a democracy. And Trinidad, how do you see it? Do you see it as, as the story of us and who is us? Uh, yeah, um, the way I talk to my students about history is uh, first uh, we get into a conversation about history being sort of a moral philosophy, kind of building on what Alan has said to reflect on the past so we could be better humans and a better society today. Uh, and the other thing I talk about history is that it's power uh, and they get kind of confused with me by power. And I said, well, uh, history can shape uh, children from K to 12 on how they see themselves in the world around them. Now, if their community their family is not included in the curriculum. That silencing is very powerful than shaping and, and damaging their psychic outlook and their participation in the nation and society they live in. So who's included and not included in the history curriculum is a value statement, but it's also reflective of who's in power. And so I try to get them to understand both the power of history and then the moral aspects of using history to make us a better community today. So your point, I, I think that's really interesting. Your point, when it connects to Alan's, is that when you're not included, when when your group or your family's experience is is excluded from the curriculum, you're no longer history is no longer about us. It's about somebody else, right? Yes. So you're learning about somebody else. You're not learning about us. Uh, Hassan, what, how do you see the teaching of history? What what is that? What is the purpose of uh, of, of history? Well, I see it, the, the teaching of it uh, as you know, a, a way to understand the past, um, but not simply to leave the past in the past. I mean, this goes back to, I think, Alan, your point about the story of us. I mean, it's not just about studying the past for the sake of studying the past. It's about studying the past so that we can make sense of the present. Uh, and then what do you do then? Right. I mean, in other words, how, would, how do you take that into the world in which we live? And then for, for, for our students, it isn't just simply you know, um, a matter of studying the past so we can make sense of the present, uh, but it's also preparing students to uh, lead in the future, uh, to participate in uh, this democracy. So you can't be prepared to uh, make the tough decisions to, to clean up the mess that we're leaving behind if you don't understand 
how that mess came to be in the first place, which is the moment we're in. And you can't do that unless you have a full and complete understanding of the past. And you can't do that unless you're studying the story of everybody, of all of us interacting. Well, it goes back to that whole idea. If you don't learn from history, you're, you're bound to repeat it, right? Well, I would actually say that when we look at it in the American context, that's probably giving us a little bit too much credit for having stopped doing the things that created inequality in the first place. I think if we don't study the past to make sense of the present, then we won't repeat. We'll just keep doing the same things. Uh, we have to really get in there and disrupt. And you can't disrupt what you don't know exists. You know, there's there's a sense of that history kind of divides, you know, um, little kids should should have one approach to history and uh, adolescents, another, maybe adults, an, another approach to history. Um, Trinidad, do you think that 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 that's how we should look at this um, or is it is it really a question of, of you should you should take the same approach, but of course, scaled to the age of of um, uh, of, of young people. How do, how do you see it? Because there is this point that is being made as if the teaching of, of different perspectives in history weakens American civil society. I, I, I don't quite get that. Um, mm. But could you comment on this whole idea of, of teaching history in different ways to people of different well, ages? Well, obviously, there's different sorts of uh, ways of teaching history at the appropriate grade level, which you can talk about. But that's different from shielding uh, younger children from the realities of the, the world, right? So as a child, I grew up hearing about my great-grandfather and his father being killed by the Texas Rangers. I wasn't shielded from that reality, uh, but I didn't get that at school. If I hurt that as a child and my parents were doing that to protect me or to give me a wider perspective, I think that can be done in the public educational realm as well. It's so important, right? You experienced the history lessons regardless as to whether it was taught in school. It would have been advantageous to have the school teachings be able to be reflective of the different perspectives of those classmates that you had, yourself and others. Right. But, but it really was just a narrative that was an alienating narrative according to your own childhood experience. Uh, Alan, did you have the same kind of an experience yourself? Absolutely. And, and I think that you know, there are definitely age appropriate, developmentally appropriate uh, ways to approach how we teach history, depending on what level we're teaching. But that's very different, you know, from from shielding young children, for instance, K, K through six, even K through eight, uh, in some cases, K through 12, you know, shielding them from these divisive topics or shielding them from the negative aspects of history and then saying, well, when they get older, will give them a, a fuller picture of the truth. And I think when we do that, when we say, well, young kids are gonna get one version of the story and then as they get older, they'll get a little more nuance, maybe a, a, a little more negative in some cases, uh, p bits of the story. I think when we do that, we create cynics instead of citizens because a, a lot of our students will say, well, why didn't I know this before? Uh, I remember when I, when I got to college, one of my first history classes, and I was hearing all these things about these heroes that I carried in with me that no one had bothered to teach me up to that point. And it, it really did make me resentful, uh, I think, of the education that I had prior to college, because I thought, why is the story that I was told so different um, than the actual facts of, of what occurred or the actual you know, other interpretations of what happened? And so I think if we're not really careful with saying, you know, young, young students can't handle certain things. And so we'll just wait until they get older to give them the full picture. Um, I, I really do think that breeds resentment within our students. And, and as I said, I think rather than creating citizens that can be active, I think we're creating cynics. And I'm not sure we need more of those right now. Let's move to, to the topic of critical race theory, because it's gotten so much prominence for, um, what at one point was was an obscure academic description. Uh, Hassan, could you uh, give us uh, give a uh, give your take on what the critical race theory um, what critical race theory is and and um, what what the fuss is about? Well, critical race theory is it really is not that complicated. Um, it's a framework for understanding the ways in which race and racism have operated historically. Um, and in the present, 
uh, in American social systems and structures. I mean, it, it is simply taking seriously the role of race and racism in American society, past and present. I mean, that's it. It, it, it really is not that complicated. Is but it, the is it just like, um, like, uh, for example, if you if you take a cut at at American history from a gender perspective, mm -hmm. or if you take a cut at American history in terms of the different religions that that uh, influenced the United or different economic systems. Is it is it really that mundane? It is an approach to understanding. I mean, and it, it literally is that it now, you know, the, the examples that you gave, everything becomes a little bit more nuanced because the way in which race operates in American society, you know, intersects in different ways with the way in which gender and sexuality operate. So we have to take that into consideration. But the broader point is absolutely correct. You cannot understand American society unless you take seriously the role of race and racism in American society, just as you can't fully understand American society unless you take seriously the role of sex and gender and sexism in American society. But the hysteria isn't about what critical race theory is actually about. I mean, the hysteria is politics, um, you know, begun by uh, folk at the, uh, you know, political conservatives who, you know, are, are playing this culture wars game rooted in race. Um, and this is an extension of, you know, first we're going to come for your guns, then we're going to come for your Bible, and now we're coming for your children, which is ginning up this sort of hysteria around those who were most animated uh, by the uh, appeals to racism uh, coming from the former president. Racism is the most powerful political organizing tool that America has ever created, and folk are well aware of that, and they're playing to that. And that has, you know, it plays on these fears that you know, we're coming for your children. And if you're not careful, you're going to lose them. So I, I'm just wondering, how, if, if you preclude the, the teaching of, and, and I, I understand, um, and, and I get this from, from all sorts of different uh, news outlets, that there's this whole series of laws, I think in your state, uh, Trinidad, in Texas, where um, you're not supposed to teach anything that is... Um, uh, what is the word? Uh, controversial? D divisive. Divisive is what they divisive, but that's 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 the language that has been utilized by the lobbyists across all the states that have passed this some for, uh, version of this bill. Right. And, and the key component of the key tr uh, trigger is not just controversial, but if a student feels uh, discomfort or anguish or some sort of doesn't like what they're being taught, that they can say, hey, wait a minute, uh, we need to stop what's being taught here, which is very vague. Uh, so, yeah, the the. The language across the states is pretty pretty similar because it's being this is a multi million dollar effort across various conservative nonprofits that are not only pushing the legislation but they're giving toolkits to parents so that they can they give them a list of about twenty words say if you hear these words you see these words in the curriculum anywhere that's critical race theory you need to go and this is how you go in front of the school board so they're actually training grassroots conservative activists to go school district by school district across the nation. But they can't be successful unless they structurally change the laws in those states, right? And that's why you're having this two prong attack: changing the laws in the state around education, conservative activists, right? So that that's the street politics of what's going on here. Uh, so education could, uh, can't really be about the Socratic method, which is really about questioning everything, right? And and assuring intellectual rigor, um, questioning every statement. How how do we teach law uh, if, if if we can't use that? That call and response kind of kind of approach of asking questions, Alan. Um, if if people are going to, uh, you know, what was the word Trinidad? Uh, discomfort. Yeah, discomfort, anguish, and there's a third for a word that they try to get it all in students and out uh, so if, concerning if, uh, if, if you're the teacher. If, if you're teaching evolution and somebody's anguished by the idea that that uh, of evolution, you can't teach it? Is that, is that the issue, Alan, uh, in the future? How, how is American education going to evolve now? And I think maybe the most remarkable part of all this is critical race theory is not a part of the K-12 curriculum in the United States. It, it's, a, it's a legal construct. It is, it's not a part of what's being taught. And so, you know, I, I absolutely agree with what's been said that this is a stalking horse for the political right. It's a stalking horse for censoring whatever they deem uh, parts of history that they don't want taught. And what's so concerning about that is, you know, we were talking earlier, you can see right over my shoulder here, there's a, a violin hanging on the wall back there. And that violin belongs to my great, 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 
grandfather screaming bare Nick. And he carried that violin with him on the trail of tears. And what I wonder about is I, as I see this legislation passing, you know, removal, I think would certainly qualify as a divisive subject. And the trail of tears is certainly in many ways uh, a stain on the United States of America. So under this legislation, is his story going to be able, am I going to be able to tell his story? And I think the answer would be absolutely not. Uh, that story would, could easily make you know, someone feel discomfort or could make someone feel sad or could make someone feel regretful uh, for what happened. So it, you know, it, it's, it's censorship. And what it is is trying to take certain elements of our history and saying to teachers, these are off limits. And, and I also think we can't separate this current attack from you know, the 30 year war on public schools and on public school teachers. Uh, in the state of North Carolina, just a few years ago, teachers lost tenure in our state. And tenure was not a lifetime appointment, right? We're not talking about Supreme Court justices. In the state of North Carolina, all tenure did is it guaranteed you due process before you could be dismissed. So when you take away those protections and then you begin adding legislation and language like this that says, here are the things we don't want you teaching, you know, teachers are really in a bind. Are they going to show that courage when it could risk their livelihood? So it, it really is part of this longstanding war against our public schools and against our public school teachers. And um, it's, it's all about censorship. So how do we end up uh, countering this, uh, you know, this whole thing about censorship is, is is so distressing. When I was growing up, I always thought that America, in part, defined itself as the uh, as the country that embraced different stories, right? Nation of immigrants. Uh, people talked about the whole idea of, of diversity, diversity of perspective that there was not just one narrative, that was the party line, right? That was, that, those were the other guys. Um, how do we recapture the good part of that, um, yet uh, tell more stories um, as we go forward to, to inform our history? How do we, instead of staying in the classroom and in the, in the protected environs of, of a college or a university, how do we get out and make sure that our ability to express ourselves within those environments as safeguarded. Hassan, are we, are, do we all have to get in, involved in the idea of just free speech now in the United States, that we have to advocate for, for, um, for being what I've always considered to be America? Well, I think this is a free speech issue, um, but it's also you know, of late, we certainly have fallen into this trap of sort of both sideism, if you will. And, and, and sometimes we want to uh, pretend as though there are two equal sides uh, worthy of sort of equal discussion and equal merit. Uh, when it comes to what we're seeing now, you know, yeah, there are two sides, but one side is right in dealing with facts and history and, other, and the other side is just making stuff up. Uh, and so part of what we have to do, I think, in this is say, wait a minute, if you want to have a serious conversation about the past as well as the present, you are not entitled, as many folk will say, to your own set of facts. Right? And you can't just whole, you know, wholly dismiss uh, segments of the past because they make you uncomfortable. You know, talking, you know, what's even more uncomfortable than talking about sort of the Trail of Tears and Atlantic slavery uh, and, and, and the like is actually experiencing the Trail of Tears and Atlantic slavery and Jim Crow. That's what's really uncomfortable. And, and so I think we just, those who uh, are, and teachers in particular, I mean, teachers, you know, take, they are committed to teaching the truth. Teachers don't go into, you know, to, to make the, the, the little bit of money that they make, especially K through 12, because they want to lie to students. Uh, and so we, outside of K through 12, really the, the, the broader public parents and academics like us, you know, have to raise our voices and say, no, no, no. Uh, we are committed to teaching the past honestly, even when it makes us uncomfortable. We have to lean into that. And we are the ones that have to provide the protection to teachers to give them the space. Uh, because as was pointed out in states like North Carolina, those protections are being ripped out from under them. So these other narratives that aren't rooted in historical truth and honesty are be, can be perpetuated. I think you provide a very, a very interesting idea, this, this 
on the other hand approach, right? Um, that you're not rejecting that there might be numerous perspectives, right? That need to be illuminated. What you're saying is that you just cannot assert without reference to anything, uh, any evidence, any facts, right? And you can't just, just take facts and throw them out in order to justify whatever your position is. So your admonition to the media is be fact-based, right? And, and Trinidad, I mean, that's what you're teaching in your classrooms. You're, you're, you're trying to, to take reference to actual events that are happening, not made up ones, right? Right. So uh, as scholars, we have an ethical obligation to follow the evidence uh, and to examine the evidence. So there's the methodological issues and the ethical issues we have as scholars and as educators when it comes to teaching history. But that doesn't mean we look at the past, say, at slavery or the Holocaust or the recent past, like the El Paso massacre, and say that there's a side there that is morally equivalent to the side that said it's OK to kill or to have slaves or to have genocide. Right. Genocide is morally wrong. The El Paso uh, massacre who had a manifesto about uh, the Hispanic invasion was morally wrong. But the way the law is set up, we're supposed to give deference to those perspectives, supposed to give deference to Hitler, deference to the El Paso uh, terrorists, deference to the people who enslaved others. Uh, and then there's, so there's a difference between our methodology and examination of the past that we have to follow ethically and as scholars. But then the evaluation of, the, of that past or the evaluation of the present does not mean all sides are morally equal. They're not. And, and I don't think that's what we should try to strive for. So we just completed uh, a couple of polls. The first poll was uh, whether people had a crisp understanding of, of critical race theory. And what was interesting was that 61 percent said yes. Thirty nine percent said no after after all of this, this discussion. So. Um, it seems that there is this attempt at branding, and it hasn't been uh, successful with at least 39% of the, uh, of the individuals. That's, that's very interesting. And then we just said, how do you, how do you view critical race theory? Um, and we said, um, we, we gave a number of different choices, uh, a way of understanding how racism has, has shaped um, uh, the United States, uh, divisive discourse that pits uh, people of color against white people. It's an exp exploration of shifting social relations and so on. 67% said it's it's a way of understanding racism, but there are also uh, those who who had other views and and didn't necessarily um, agree one way or one way or the other with any of the the choices that we provided. I have a question for you, Alan. Sort of uh, working off of uh, Trinidad and Hassan's point, uh, who is the keeper of facts? Um, this was, uh, by the way, prompted by uh, one of our attendees. Who is the keeper of facts? I, I think that's a responsibility for every single American. Uh, I think one of the things we have to make sure we do is not pretend that the historical truth is, is anybody's um, sole possession, whether it be uh, the, hist the professional historian, whether it be the high school history teacher. I think the, the keeper of fact has to be all of us and, and building on, on what was said earlier. That's why I think it is about free speech, but it's also about making sure that our free speech is closely, closely tethered to intellectual honesty. And that's a responsibility for each and every one of us. It's not something that we can, I think, lay at the doorstep of one particular group. I think so much of these, so many of, of these bills and so much of this legislation just utterly ignores the, the complexity and the nuance of history. You know, and I, I see a lot of it as white politicians selling white people short, because if I teach about removal, white people are no more monolithic than any other group. And so while removal was tragic and horrible, there were white missionaries who went to prison for standing against President Jackson's policies. There were white politicians who threw their careers away fighting uh, the approval of that treaty and the ratification of the New Echota Treaty. So there's so much complexity and nuance. And we have politicians who many of them, I'm sure, don't know the nuance, but others who just simply don't care. They want the entire topic you know, put away and hidden. And I think it's up to every single one of us to fight back against this. If this falls on the shoulders of public school teachers alone, that's just one more burden uh, that that profession 
is not in a position right now to fight, at least not without the help of parents and the help of concerned citizens. So I think that responsibility really, really falls on the shoulders of every one of us who, who believes we're a citizen in this republic. And you're saying that the teaching of history is not indoctrination and it's not a monologue. It's a, it, it's a dialogue. It's a multidimensional uh, exploration so that if a student in, in a uh, class happens to know about the Tulsa massacre or if a student in the class happens to have a great, 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 great grandfather who experienced or, or a, a grandparent who experienced the massacres of, of Native peoples and the suppression of cultures through uh, schooling, uh, that, that student should be able to contribute to that class, right, uh, Hassan? That student absolutely should be. And this is where uh, we're already sliding down that slippery slope because uh, if you read if it's sort of by the letter of these new laws, bills that are being passed, if that student raises that issue in the state of Tennessee or in Ohio, if that's passed uh, a year, then the teacher by obligation, the response will be, well, I can't talk about that. And so now is this a free speech issue, right? I mean, the, the free speech, not just of the teacher, but of the student who wants to raise and discuss these issues. And, and, and that, that's, that's terrible. You're telling students that we cannot explain, we cannot explore, we cannot answer your question about something so fundamental, about fundamental issues in the American experience. That's just, that, that's both tragic and criminal. One of the things that I really love about, uh, in particular, the history of, of Texas is the truth of the history of Texas and not necessarily the image that we get from, um, from Westerns and so on. I mean, even the ethnicities of, of, of the cowboys and the vaqueros uh, who, who uh, populated Texas. Um, Trinidad, can you give us uh, just sort of a, a brief um, uh, sort of juxtaposition between history and reality and why reality is so much more textured and so much more beautiful than, um, than the, the imaginary um, images that, that um, are, are sometimes conveyed? Well, I mean, uh, obviously the classic images or mythologies around Texas is the, the cowboy, right? Uh, uh, and, and that's problematic in, in so many ways because the image of the cowboy then is usually one that's white and reality is cowboys were black, indigenous and uh, Hispanic or Latino, if you will. Uh, uh, because really being a cowboy is difficult work. I, I come from a family of vaqueros, uh, and it's not the kind of job you want to go on and do. This is this is what you're striving for, right? And, you know, unlike, unlike the movie City Slickers. So there's nuance and complexity just to that iconic image of the cowboy, right? Uh, but then there's other parts of uh, Texas history that are, are important that that play out in reality, right? The long string of Supreme Court cases uh, from Texas uh, related to civil rights. Or the state of Texas is always taking the wrong position when it comes to civil rights through its long history. Uh, and that is in the records of the Supreme Court because those, those court cases exist, but it doesn't get into the textbooks the way it should. Uh, even in higher education, we don't have enough of that teaching about the civil rights efforts within Texas, or more importantly, the cross-racial and ethnic coalitions that existed in Texas to fight back against these sorts of laws, right? So you had white liberals, white labor, uh, African-Americans and, and Latinos working with each other uh, to try to undo a lot of these things that were problematic in the state of Texas, but that doesn't get taught. That sort of cross ethnic and racial alliances that, that had existed and still exist today, by the way. Alan, um, we're gonna give you the last word since we're nearing the end of our, our discussion. Um, if you were going to be able to encourage the entire country to uh, take uh, some idea of, of, of how history can be conveyed that would benefit the country as a whole, help to unify us, but also help us to navigate our future as Hassan um, so eloquently stated earlier in the program. What would that idea be if, if you were talking to uh, every lobbyist on both sides? Of, of, of these various issues. I think I would just want to remind everyone that we have to struggle every day to secure the freedoms and the liberties that uh, too many of us take for granted. And I think what history shows us is democracy is a journey. Democracy is not an endpoint. And it has to be it has to be won through struggle that is a daily struggle. Uh, there's not a moment where we can say, all right, we are now the perfect union. 
we continue to struggle to try to, to, to grow closer to that more perfect union. Um, there's not an end point where we can turn around and, and pat ourselves on the back and say, we've made it, you know, we're here, we're the country that we've always wanted to be. And, and there are, there are no issues. Uh, that, that's, that's not a realistic view. And so the study of history, we can, we can prepare for that struggle. We can, we can get ourselves ready for the dark days and, and the low moments. Um, and we can also celebrate the victories. You know, we can see the genius of Sequoia and, and the courage of Dr. King. And, and so we, it's, it's not this, you know, relentless negative tale, but those negative stories are important because they've been a part of the struggle. And, and as Hassan said so beautifully, they're still part of the struggle. The past, you know, I think it was Faulkner, right? The past is not really the past in the South. Well, I think that's true for most of the United States. So I would say it's a reminder of us that, or a reminder to us that the struggle is ours. It wasn't just our ancestors. It's a struggle that that is passed along generation to generation. And I think, you know, we've deified the founders, which I think is very problematic. But I, I think in many ways, there's that understanding, you know, that in their vision, that it's a striving towards something as opposed to an arrival. And that something is the more perfect union that I think I still believe, uh, and I hope I'm not wrong, most of us, most Americans still want. And I think that history prepares us for that, I believe, better than any topic that's part of the curriculum. We are a beautiful country, a beautiful people for the tapestry of who we are, for the richness of our different stories. Dr. Alan Bryant uh, at the Appalachian State University and director of the Gaduji program as a partnership of the University and the Cherokee Central Schools and Dr. Trinidad Gonzalez, uh, uh, Mexican-American studies instructor at South Texas College and co-founder of Refusing to Forget, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. Associate Professor of History at Ohio State University. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your perspectives with us. It's just been so incredibly informative. Everyone stay healthy. Thank you, attendees. Thank you, uh, everyone who has shared questions with us. Been so very helpful. Everybody stay safe. That's the Nonprofit Report, and we'll see you on Thursday. Take care. Thank you.